These 10 common mistakes aren't in any particular order. But let's start with a good old perspective error that I see constantly. I suspect this is the most common perspective error. In this error, instead of these angles increasing as they get higher above the eye level, a certain angle is chosen and then above that, the lines become parallel. Goodness, having drawn vanishing points, I almost forgot to use them. And in some ways, these parallel lines can sort of look not too bad. But when we see the lines as they should be placed, we can see they create much more visual drama. Don't make the mistake of your perspective angles staying parallel to the angle of the line underneath it. And don't be afraid to draw what could well be some very extreme angles as the lines get higher. Here's the second common error. Let me redraw it without the error. And the second most common mistake is to fail to add lines to indicate depth or thickness. And it particularly seems to happen with windows and roof lines. So there is a depth, there is a setback to this space here where the roof overhangs the wall. And here there's no allowance for the eaves. And of course, strips of timber that are used in windows invariably show not just their front side, their width, but also some degree of their side face. And when we don't allow for that in our drawing, we get a very flat cartoon-like effect. If we don't add the depth line, we have nowhere to put shade, nowhere to put the hatch in or the tone to catch the shadows that the light source may be creating. The third mistake I often see is that instead of drawing a nice crisp straight line, we get this what's often called a fuzzy line that comes from drawing lots of short lines that we overlap. And while this line doesn't have to be in the wrong place, the fact that it's a fuzzy texture does create an unreality in our scene if a clean straight edge is what we need, particularly in the corner of a building. Now clearly this comes from a lack of confidence, but being able to draw clean straight lines freehand is an important skill to learn, particularly if we're going to draw architecture. So can I recommend that it's worth doing exercises just in straight line drawing? I do have a number of videos just on this if you're interested. Is this a common mistake you make in your drawings? If it is, can I recommend that you spend a little time practicing nice straight lines and building the confidence to draw them with your pen? For our fourth common mistake, we need a simple drawing. And this will do. And this mistake is where we want to use hatching to indicate shade and shadow. And what happens is the hatching or cross hatching is laid over the top of our drawing without any regard for the shape or the direction of the structures that are under the hatching we get the same 45 degree crisscross hatching over every part of the scene that requires hatching. So how might this look if we do it a different way? So what's a better approach? A better approach is that we use the direction of our hatching lines to suggest the shapes, the directions of the objects that the shade and the shadow or the color is resting on. One of the most helpful things I find to consider this is what the perspective angles will be. So for this ceiling area, I have the perspective angle of this line and of this line, and I try and slope all of these lines in what the perspective angle would be for any line at that point back to the same vanishing point. The other thing that this does is it gives us no flexibility for varying the intensity of tone to make it darker or lighter. Whereas here, I've been able to increase the darkness in this section of shadow on the wall, 
which is going to be darker than this shade over here. And if you don't know the distinction between shade and shadow, I have a video on that. So that's probably well worth watching at this point because it's a very helpful distinction to understand when we're drawing. How do you go in this area of mistake? Does your hatching look more like this or more like this? Our fifth common mistake is one that involves a line work. Now this may look okay because there hopefully aren't any mistakes with the perspective or anything. So let me draw it again without the, what I see as a common error and see if you can spot the difference. So with the two very similar drawing subjects done, this point is all to do about the weight of the line that we use. We can adjust the weight of our line and therefore how wide and dark it is, both by the pressure we use when we draw our line, but also by switching pens. In this case, from a 0.5 millimeter pen to a 0.3 to a 0.2 to a 0.1 millimeter pen. We can also adjust the size of the marks we use to draw the same thing. So with these bushes here, I've used pretty much the same size mark and the same weight of pen for the outlines and for the hatching to indicate shade. But in this drawing, I've not just reduced the thickness of the line as the bushes become further away, but I've also used smaller marks to create the same effects to give a sense that we're looking at this reduced in size down here. And for this tree behind the houses, we get a sense that it's peeking out from some distance away because of the very light line and just the merest suggestion of detail. So this common mistake can be summed up in using the same weight of line and the same scale of marks for everything in our scene, regardless of how close or far it is. And it can make the drawing seem very heavy handed where the lines of the individual parts become actually more prominent than what they're drawing. Do you tend to use the same heaviness of line and size of mark for similar things across the whole drawing, regardless of how close or far away they are? Because in life, things in the distance are not seen as clearly and they don't look as dark. So our line work can try and reflect this number effect. Six, I'll change my order and I'll draw the correct one first. So here we have a wall that's sloping away from us with a row of windows on it. Let's draw it again. Can you see what's happened here? In this first example, we've used foreshortening. The principle that as an object moves further away from us, such as this wall, it becomes more and more visually compressed. So the windows start to appear narrower the further away they are, and the spaces between the windows appear narrower the further away they are, and the thickness of the wall appears narrower the further away it is. However, in this second example, we've drawn each of the windows much more the same size. We've only given really a slight concession to making them smaller as they move away, as well as not really reducing the gaps between them at all. And there are two unfortunate consequences for this with our drawing. One is that our wall has to become longer to fit the five windows in. But secondly, the proportions change. So a window which has these proportions ends up being, ends up being a more squat rectangle by the end of the row than it is at the beginning. And in the worst examples of these, the windows can literally go from being rectangular to square across the length of about six windows. Once we don't get foreshortening correct, all of our proportions start to look awkward. But our walls can start to look like this, where the windows do go from rectangular to pretty much square, instead of looking like this. And look how much the proportions of the building have to change to accommodate the extra width in our drawing that a wall not properly foreshortened creates. So how do you go with this very common error? I'll go back to drawing the error first with our seventh point. So what's wrong with this scene? Well, there's a few things wrong with this. 
the perspective is wrong, the foreshortening is wrong. But I really drew this because it shows when we have a number of perspective errors happening at the same time, what it means is the whole scale, the whole proportion of the building of the scene of trying to place figures in it looks wrong. Like I can't tell from here whether this is incorrectly drawn perspective or whether it's sloping uphill. And if I were to draw people walking down the whole street, they seem to get smaller and smaller too quickly. And to use the same scale in relation to these windows, this person at the end of the street is so tiny, they look truly ridiculous. There is no eye level. If this road is level with this road across the front here, then it's actually impossible to draw the figures properly. And of course we have the problem that we just saw where when the foreshortening is not correct, our windows change proportions. So how would this look? So here we have the same scene with a much more credible perspective scale used. And so suddenly there isn't the same awkwardness. It's clear that this isn't an uphill street. This is actually a level street. There's consistent use of one eye level. The foreshortening means that this wall looks like it sits back in the right spot as it moves away. Our footpath narrows pleasingly instead of staying the same width at the same time that everything else gets narrower or smaller in the scene. And because the scale is correct, we're able to put figures all throughout our scene that look right in relation to each other. And we're able to align their heads correctly, which we're unable to do in this scene. This is a really common drawing mistake where the scale and proportions are so inconsistent that where parts of the drawing may work together, other parts don't work with it. And while it might be clear to the artist who's been looking at a reference, for those of us who only have the drawing to go on, it's not nearly so clear what's really this happening. This common mistake is very common. And it's where instead of actually drawing the detail that we see, we use a pattern instead to, in a way, represent the detail. And it's most commonly seen in leaves, in foliage. Leaves represent a huge problem. We know that leaves have individual shapes, but when we're confronted with a tree, there are millions of leaves all at once. And how do we represent the millions of tiny details that we know are in that tree? And you can tell that while it often starts out with a certain amount of detail and intention, it becomes more scribbly and squiggly as it gets on. And unfortunately, rather than actually looking like the foliage on any tree, reflecting the patterns of light and shade and shadow that the tree might have, it's more like there was a sheet of paper with this pattern on it and the silhouette of the tree canopy has been cut out from this pattern and just dropped on top. And because of that, it has the effect of flattening what should be a very rounded and very three-dimensional shape of the tree canopy. So here we have a tree that's drawn differently. I've not tried to represent any leaves because we can't see any leaves in this tree because of how large it is. What I've tried to do is to capture the effect of light on this very rough surface that the edge of all of the leaves give and catch the light. And while I think it looks very much more like a tree than this one does, it actually took no longer to draw than that one took. And if drawing a tree is a problem, if you make this common mistake of just having a leaf pattern that you put over the tree canopy, rather than trying to capture the effect of the leaves in the light, then can I suggest you look at my How to Draw a Tree playlist, where I have about 10 videos on drawing trees and foliage. It's actually not so hard to develop a technique to draw very credible looking trees very easily. 
I actually really enjoy trees, which makes me think it's a shame that they are a particular problem area for so many people who enjoy drawing. So, is this a common mistake area for you? This next very common mistake also involves foreshortening, but if you like, it's ground level foreshortening. And we most often see this mistake when we have pathways. So for instance, we might have a pathway that's drawn like this, when a far more accurate way to represent the divisions of the pathway into equal concrete blocks would be to draw it like this. Because here we actually have foreshortening at work. Another common mistake with pathways, particularly where there are cobblestones, is to end up with something that looks like this. When the reality is going to look a lot more like this. The effect of drawing our cobblestones like this is to make this look more like a pyramid standing upwards than a pathway or a road lying flat, moving further away from us quite quickly. How do your pathways look? Are they like ladders or pyramids? Or does our correct use of foreshortening make them lie down flat as they disappear into the distance? And the final common mistake I see is simply careless lines. And by this, I don't mean lines that don't go right. I can be trying to get this line to there and it can end up a bit too high. That's not a careless line. That's a line where I've made a mistake drawing it. But a careless line is a quick scribbly line. It's a line where really I'm having no regard for anything, where for some reason I'm needing to put lines in that spot. And instead of taking some care, even in a fairly brisk gestural drawing such as that one, we use a scribble technique, which saves us so little time and yet diminishes the overall effect of our drawing so much. It's just as we saw in our tree scribble foliage. Thoughtful placing of lines really doesn't take longer than scribbling, but it does take practice in observing and experimenting with a technique until we find a technique which creates the effect we want. I think of this sort of cross hatching as careless lines, because we're just placing them on because, oh, that's the shade. So I put this crisscross of lines over all the shade. And when I do this, I don't need to observe my reference more carefully. I don't need to look for subtlety of differences of shade and shadow in one part of the drawing to another. I don't have to worry about what's happening underneath, what direction the surfaces I'm putting the hatching, cross hatching onto take. But I think of these lines as careless lines too. So how do you go on this final mistake? Do you fall into the trap of thinking that some parts of the drawing are less important than others? It's not just the perspective angles that need to be done carefully, although they do. Every line that we put on our paper to bring a certain object into reality, to create a sense of three dimensions of distance on a two-dimensional sheet of paper with a two-dimensional line, needs to be done with concentration and commitment. Oh yes, these lines slope. Yes, they do slope, but they are never parallel unless they're horizontal. And when we combine error upon error in our scene, we end up with something that certainly doesn't look right. And this second correct version took no more time to draw than this incorrect one. We get better at what we practice. And if we end up drawing foliage in this way all the time, we will get better and quicker at drawing foliage like this. But if we adopt a technique of drawing trees where we're trying to create the form that we see the trees have, where we try to create the effect of the light on the leaves, and if we practice and practice doing it that way, we will become much quicker at drawing trees with a technique that gives a greater sense of reality to something which, let's face it, is impossible to draw exactly. And of course, if you're happy with the technique you're using, if you're happy with the way your drawings are turning out, then go for it. But if you're wanting a greater degree of realism, these are the ways I create it. So it may just be helpful for you to consider these. G'day, I'm Stephen Travers. Please hit subscribe. If you find my videos helpful, tell your friends 
that helps my channel a lot. I'll see you next time. Bye.